Good evening. Good evening. I'm Larry Souter, and welcome to Stories of Amazing Grace. We're coming to you from Bixter Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us online. Some are listening by way of radio and on Apple Podcast, and of course, for being a part of our live audience. Our theme scripture comes from Romans 8, 38 through 39. I'm sure that nothing can separate us from God's love, not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present nor the future, and not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. My guest tonight is Diane Burton. She drove all the way from Oklahoma through Arkansas to get here, so we appreciate that. She is the author of The Master's Masterpiece, A Preacher's Wife's Journey from a Broken and Fat Masterpiece to the Master's Piece. And that's available in the lobby and also at the mastersmasterpiece.com website. Her many titles include Grief Coach and Christian Women's Life Coach, Health Coach, and Holistic Cancer Educator, and the creator of the Wisdom Board and Wisdom Series. In her Wisdom Board workshops, Diane helps women realize the importance of God's wisdom to help them spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially. And Diane was featured as a TEDx presenter in 2018 at Harding University. And I've asked Diane to share about 15 minutes of that TEDx talk with us tonight before we take the stage for the interview. So please welcome Diane Burton. Come on up. Thank you so much. It is a joy to be here. And actually, my talk's not 15 minutes. <laughs> I scaled it down a little bit. And I am using notes. I'm just going to tell. He asked me just a couple of days ago, would you be willing to do that? And I said, sure, I'll have to dust it off and pull it out. And so it's not memorized like it was. So I hope you'll bear with me as I use my notes. In January of 2011, I made the decision to get out of a very toxic relationship a relationship I'd been in for over 40 years. This wasn't easy. I had, look, had to look at this person every day. I lived with them 24-7. This toxic relationship wasn't with someone else. It was with me. And I knew with certainty it was time to leave. I discovered I had allowed this toxic relationship to keep me from being who God intended me to be. I found myself sabotaging my dreams and my goals by my toxic self-talk. I told myself I wasn't smart enough, pretty enough, good enough. Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. The bully said it once. I said it to myself thousands of times. I was my own worst enemy. So how could I go from bully to bold? Before I share that, let me take you back to junior high and high school so you can understand why I care so much about those who are bullied. I haven't always looked like this. I used to look, got it, like that. I looked different to the majority of people. I was the fat girl growing up. And I know it's politically incorrect to call someone fat, but that's what I was called, and so I'm using that word. I actually started gaining weight when I was six years old, and by the time I was a senior in high school, I weighed around 213 pounds, and I was a target. I was the brunt of many jokes. I was made fun of. I was laughed at in the classroom from degrading remarks that teachers made. I was bullied. It seemed as though people didn't think I had feelings, and I allowed myself to feel worthless, stupid, and ugly. It made me numb. I allowed it to cause me to eat more. And I often ask, why was I made like this? Why couldn't I just look like the popular girls? Are any of you remembering a time maybe you were bullied? I know that it's in the audience. I've had people tell me. It was January of 1971, my senior year in high school, when I began losing the weight physically. And it was January of 2011 during a coaching process while being trained to be a grief coach when I emotionally released the weight of the fat girl. I had allowed those degrading words to haunt me and shape my life for 40 years. 
After I got home from that grief coach training, I took this fat girl picture, that one, and for some reason I carried it in my wallet. And I took it and I tore it up. And I put it in a dish. I had my husband and I were sitting at the dining table and I burned it. And I said, this is no longer me. And since then, it's been a daily process of paying attention to my thoughts and learning to love the person in the mirror. With much study and prayer, I learned many lessons from being bullied by myself and others. And these turned out to be gifts, which I got to unwrap, allowing me to step into my full potential. You know, there's a myth that says words don't matter, but the truth is words do matter. And I'm going to share three gifts that I got to unwrap, and I pray that they will be gifts for you. And you'll agree that words matter. Does that sound good? So first of all, the first gift was understanding words matter to others. And this was really obvious to me as I was bullied. Yet sadly, in trying to pretend the words didn't hurt or matter, I found myself using sarcasm as a defense mechanism. It's been said that hurt people hurt people. And like the 160,000 kids who stay home from school each day for fear of being bullied, I dreaded what other kids or the teachers were going to say. And then there's a saying, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. It's the biggest lie out there. And yet, I can't tell you how many times I would come back with that when someone would call me a name. That's what I would say to them. The words hurt, and they hurt deeply. Words such as Ellie, short for elephant. I was called fatty, fatty, two by four, can't fit through the kitchen door. And in my yearbook, a couple of guys wrote something to me in the yearbook. One of them wrote, to biggin and only. And then the other one wrote, to the coolest fat girl I've ever known. So I guess there's something good there. I was cool. <laughs> I may have been fat, but I was a cool kid. Now, while working on this talk, I found some alarming facts. Did you know that words lead to many negative outcomes, including suicide, for both the one that's being bullied and the bully? And y'all, that could have been me, and it could have been someone that you know. And yet a lot of adults just say, oh, they're just making fun. It's no big deal. But I'm sure if you're like me, you've seen several posts where teenagers are taking their life by suicide. And according to the CDC, suicide is the third leading cause of death among young people. There's a story I read about a school that decided to do an, an experiment about the impact words have on others. They took two beautiful, healthy plants, just visualize those beautiful green plants, and they put them on display. And they had them in two separate areas because the students were to talk negatively to one plant, and it was bombarded with a recording of verbal abuse. The other plant, they were supposed to say kind words to it, and it was bombarded with a recording of kind words. Can you guess what happened? As one student said, the plant that was bullied died. If that happens to a plant, can you imagine what it does to a human? Now, the second gift I got to unwrap was understanding that words matter to me. I started paying attention to those degrading, toxic, lying words I said to myself. I said things like, Diane, you are so stupid. Diane, those clothes will make you look fat. Diane, you'll never be a success as a wife, as a mother, as an entrepreneur. I was shocked when I realized what a toxic relationship I was in with myself. And I decided it was to time to stop listening to the bully in my head. And an interesting thing happened as I was preparing the lesson I recorded so I could listen to it. 
And when I listened to myself say those words back, I almost cried, thinking, how could I do that? It just almost made me sick. I couldn't believe that I would allow myself. I once heard someone, a coach, she had been coaching someone, and she said, I don't even want to hold in my hands the words that are coming out of your mouth because they were such negative, toxic words. And because of how I listened to myself, I realized I was really convinced of the power of words. And I saw this amazing power when I did an exercise with some students at a Christian school. It's an exercise I do with my clients, and, and all of you can do it. It's really simple. I gave each of the students, and this was kindergarten through 12th grade, and the teachers a mirror. And I said, I want you to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I love you, and then say your name. You should have heard the giggles and seen the smiles. The teachers were amazed at the difference it made for those children. And yet, I've asked my clients to do it, and some of them have told me they've cried because they, it was so hard for them to look in the mirror and just say, I love you, say in their name. By me doing this exercise, I began to feel empowered and bold and loved. I realized that if I truly loved the person in the mirror, how in the world could I bully her? And then the third gift that I unwrapped was the fact that words matter to God. The Bible tells me that God knew me before I was born, that I'm a masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. I'm made in him, his image. He's my creator. And not only did it make me feel really sick listening to myself, but it really, really affected me when I realized how critical I'd been to God's creation. Complaining about my body, my face, my brain. It felt like a punch in the gut. There I was, a leader in a direct sales company, Bible class teacher, a mother, a grandmother, a preacher's wife. I'm supposed to be an example and a leader to others, and yet I was a broken masterpiece. I was allowing those words to harm me emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And it was time to speak kindly to myself, to love my masterpiece, to be bold, to step into my purpose and mission of glorifying God, sharing Christ, and serving others. I came to the truth that those words I said to myself were really words of criticism to God. And basically, I was being a bully to him. A mentor asked me one time if I lost everything I criticized, my body, my face, my brain, what would I be willing to pay to get it back? She said, would you be willing to pay a million dollars? Her question made me realize how valuable and priceless I am to God. The fact that he created me, knit me together in my mother's womb, showed me the value God places on his amazing creation. Every one of his masterpieces are unique. Every one of you. Every one of you is different. Every one of you is a masterpiece. You're one of a kind. There's no one else on this earth like you or like me. So tonight, after you look in the mirror and tell yourself that you love you, pick up the phone and call someone you love because words matter. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. I wonder if uh, the audience might have some questions before we actually begin the interview, if Anthony is ready for that. Mm -hmm. May have prompted some thoughts in your mind. Do you might want to ask her something? Nope. <laughs> if not, that's okay. Yeah. We'll get to that later. Well, the, uh, the book was important to you to write and important to others, I assume. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How has it helped others? It's helped them to realize, it's helped them to realize that they are special to God and to realize that they, 
that they are that masterpiece and they're not a piece of junk. God doesn't create junk. They are a treasure. And so as people have read this, they've realized that even with the foods they eat and the thoughts that they have, it's harmful to the body. And that God has loaned us this body. It, it really doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. And so I want to take care of it for him. And it's helped other people realize that. We have some pictures from your childhood. Let's take a look at some of these. Yeah. What, what's the age progression here? Do you know? This is about the time I started gaining weight. I think this one was about third grade. That one may be sixth or seventh grade, sixth grade. Oh, that sad haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Can the Bible help us lose weight? I believe it can because well, of well, the scriptures me. that are there. The scriptures that you just go to Psalm 139 and you read about how God. I love the part where it says he knit me together. He took special care when he created every single person in this room. And I believe that if we will really focus on what he created here and the how intricate all our organs are you know I can't look in there and see what's going on yet I can take care of it I can give it the kind of care it needs because if I don't we're gonna end up sick and yes we're not here forever all of us will die yet I believe it's important for me to take, to give it the care so that I can be my best for him. I think that's something to really think about, Larry, because there are people who cannot do some works for the Lord right now because they have chosen not to take care of themselves. And therefore, they're not able to go and do some things. And that fits in with being a grandmother. That's one of the things I wanted to be sure that I can go play with those grandsons. You want to be around. Yeah. Yeah, and so I believe that if we will really pay attention, and in Second Thessalonians, is it First Thessalonians five twenty three? Correct me if I'm wrong. We're to be blameless, mind, body, spirit, for the coming of Christ. So mind, about, body, and spirit. Mm -hmm. So that incorporates all of it. Yes, my soul has got to be prepared to meet him, but I believe that it's important for me to take care of the physical body also. We have another photo. You mentioned the senior high school picture. This is another picture mm -hmm. from the same grade. Same year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you mentioned a note. I, we have a shot of that note. You can't, you can't read it here, but it, it says, Diane, the coolest fat girl I've ever met. Did you get used to these comments, or were they, were they devastated every time you, you read these? Oh, when I, when I started my book and pulled out my annual and started looking at things and saw that, I was reminded. You know, I had kind of pushed it aside, but I was reminded. And it does not get e any easier to have someone say something like that to you. It's hurtful. And every day, it happened. So, no, it doesn't get any easier. What was the point where you said, I'm going to lose this weight? Did someone say something to you? Did you have some epiphany? What, what, what was it? It was, well, it was constant all through the years of people letting me know that I was overweight, which was like, can you, you know, I do look in a mirror and I do see it. <laughs> and people remind me all the time. But as long as people were telling me how fat I was and I needed to lose weight, I wasn't going to do it. It was almost a very stubborn, rebellious type attitude. In my senior year, I would go to school in the morning, and in the afternoon, I would work at a bank. And one of the ladies at that bank, several of the ladies talked about losing weight and things like that, and she said, hey, Diane, some of us are going to a weight loss meeting tonight. You want to go? I was like, yeah, I'll go with you. I have no idea why I agreed but I agreed to go. And so I went and we were given choices of different diets and things like that. And I picked a diet and I went home and told my mom this is what I was going to do. And that was January of 1971. 
and I stuck to it and lost the weight uh, a lot by the time I graduated and more by the time I started college. And then over the years, I've I now say released. I've released more to where I am now. So it was just that invitation. And what's interesting is she went to church with us. And it wasn't until maybe three or four years ago it dawned on me. I wonder if she and my mom collaborated on that for her to invite me. And I have no idea because my mom has passed away. But it's okay if it was, if they did. It worked. And so it was time. Do you have suggestions of what we should and should not eat? You know what I have sitting out here, buckets of candy. <laughs> I do, I do. Um, stay away from the processed foods. Stay away from sugar. Um, they're harmful. They really are harmful to the body. I eat mostly plant-based just because I feel better that way and um, it's easy for me. It's not that I never eat meat and I'm not against eating meat. It's just I prefer. Are you tempted though? Are you tempted? Sometimes. Uh -huh. Yeah, especially when my husband fixes a, a pork roast on the, uh -huh. you know, the Boston butt on the, on the grill. I might eat a little bit, but I will also uh, purchase when, when I can clean and organic instead of not because you you got to be careful of what you ate ate okay so that's why I'm very careful I don't know what they may have fed that animal hmm. and whatever that animal ate it's going in my body and if y'all think about it you know people think they have to have all this protein you can get a lot of protein from plants because what do cows eat? They eat plants. <laughs> Hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, so that's, that's just a little bit of recommendation. Have you had supper tonight? I have. You have? What did you eat tonight? Where did you go in Nashville to eat? Yeah, and here I am not, I don't know my way around very well, so I was possibly going to get a vegetarian sandwich at Subway. That's pretty good. With the bread? Yeah, I'll eat some bread. Okay. Yeah. Um, but no cheese. And the chocolate chip cookies? No, no. I don't. <laughs> I eat popcorn. Yeah. But anyway, for well, let's supper... See a, let's see a popcorn picture here. Oh, yeah. This is a popcorn, I, popcorn I, in this here. This was at a store, and I put it on for uh, You Are What You Eat. I actually have some popcorn in my hotel room that uh -huh. if I want it. Yeah, clean. So you had Subway tonight? Nope. Oh. Nope, I couldn't find a Subway. There is a pizza place, though, attached to the hotel. Yes, yes. So I went in and I started looking. I got a cauliflower crust. Now, I don't know everything that's in it. Cauliflower but was, crust. Oh, it sounds yummy. It was, it was <laughs> actually delicious. Yes. And instead, I have found I have some food sensitivity. So instead of the tomato sauce, they did uh, like an oil and garlic kind of white sauce. So very, it was pretty good. You had a, co a Coca-Cola, I guess. No. 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 And I had some veggies put on it. And I had a vegan cheese on it. Uh -huh. And it was really. And you walked away satisfied. I was, yeah, it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really tempted to eat the whole thing, but I didn't. Because <laughs> it was about that, that would have been too much. It was about that big, and I just kept looking at it, and I was like, "No." See, here's something I will share. I have an addictive behavior to food, and I still do. And if when you go out to eat, if there's like the tortilla chips there, I'm better off if I don't eat any. Because if I eat one, I want to eat three or four bowls of I it. I understand. And the same. So I kept looking at that pizza. And I was like, there is no need to eat all that. I stuck it in the fridge. And so it is a constant mind thing that I have to work on. And I've learned to just say no. Because in 10 minutes, I won't remember how it tasted. And then I have to, I be, I've become aware of how it will make me feel. And so that's made it easier. So 
I'm not a perfectionist at this. I'm still very tempted by food. And uh, as I said, I, I want to eat lots of it. So, yeah. Keep sitting here. I feel like I need to <laughs> be like this. <laughs> well, the, the fat girl stayed with you. You lost the weight, but the fat girl stayed with you. Explain that. Every time, one of the things I did, you know, I mentioned, uh, Diane, you'll look, those clothes will make you look fat. Every time I got dressed, I would look in the mirror and I would say to my husband, does this make me look fat? And what, I would What can he say? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it didn't, but I was so scared of putting the weight back on. Because I, I just knew if I ever put it back on, I would be bullied again. People would start making comments to me again. And... Even, even as, as an adult? Yes, yes. And not long after we got married, I actually started to put a little bit of weight on. And someone made a comment to me. Oh, you've started putting some weight on. Uh. And I nearly, I just almost cried. And she was right. And I immediately was like, mm -mm, no, we can't have this. But I had married someone whose mom liked to bake and have sweets and stuff. So I found myself starting to eat some of that. And I, I stepped away and said, no. But see, that was before I had released the fat girl in my head. And that was before I knew how to eat. That was back in 1975, right after we got married. And I thought, I'm, I'm not going to be one of those that gains weight and everything. How important is exercise with your diet? I believe it's important. It wasn't at the time, I, because back in 1971, it wasn't that big a deal. You know, people weren't exercising like they do now. But I have learned that it's important for my heart, for my, for my well-being, and exercise is really good for your brain. And I want to have a healthy brain. And that's the other thing about eating certain foods. Are y'all aware that your brain, the most important foods for your brain, what fuels your brain, are, are plants? It's the plant foods. And healthy fats like avocado. And Hershey bars? Yeah. <laughs> That's the wrong sugar. <laughs> but the first 20% of what you eat goes to your brain. It's wow. going to take it and wow. gobble it up. And so I want it to have good stuff. <laughs> well, okay. We have some shots of you exercising in the gym, I believe. Yep. That's me. And you, you keep this up? I do. Now, since routine? we've moved, since we've moved, I don't have this place to go. And I found out she's retired since I left. I guess she couldn't handle me being gone. So um, I am now going to a fitness center and have a trainer. I'm, I'm not getting to go this week. But, yeah, I did, I did weights on Monday. It's, it's, and and it's, it's more, you know, a lot of people work out so that they can, you know, have all this muscle and everything. I work out so that I can be strong and healthy. And um, I have a little bit of the osteoporosis going. I've got these little bitty bones. Can you imagine 200 pounds on this body with little bones? I didn't, I always thought I had big bones uh -huh. <laughs> until I lost weight. And um, so I, it's important to exercise for that reason. How about your husband? Is he, uh, is he okay? O overweight? Underweight? About right? He could stand to release some He could stand to lose some? <laughs> yes, we eat differently. I'll just put it you that way. You have some arguments once in a while about nope. that? Nope. Nope. No. He eats what he likes, and I eat what I eat, and I've just accepted it. And um, He eats some meat once in a while? Oh, all the time. <laughs> Yeah, he's the burger, hamburger, pizza, lasagna guy. I'll be over. His, yeah. <laughs> he, 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 um, he started teaching an online Bible course for a school of preaching last night. So he ate early because it was at 530. 
And so he said, I'll probably eat a little something when, afterwards, and it was over at 8.30. So when I was talking to him today, I said, did you eat anything? He said, yeah, I had french fries. <laughs> so that's, that's how we eat in well, my tell house. Us about the, you mentioned your husband. Tell us about the background a little bit in, in churches and religious uh, upbringing and education. Well, what does he, he do now? He's, he's still a preacher. Okay. Um, he grew up in West Virginia. And um, we met at Harding University and got married. And his first year, his first job for one year was a youth minister in Indiana. And then he got a job as a minister in what we call the boonies of West Virginia. I did not know that people could live that far out. You know, our preacher from the boonies of West yes. Virginia. As a matter of fact, his grandmother-in-law was my husband's Tennessee mom. Hmm. Yeah, she lived in Cookville, Tennessee when we were there. And he would take her to West Virginia when he would go so that she could wow. visit her son. And so we've, we've lived in West Virginia and Arkansas and Tennessee. And now he's doing interim work in uh, Ponca City, Oklahoma. So we Have were you 20... spoken to, to women's groups about weight loss? Uh, I've talked to them about being God's masterpiece. Okay. Yeah, I approach it that way more than I approach it in the sense of teaching them how to lose weight. Because I can teach you all day long how to lose weight. I can lay a diet out or an eating plan. I like to call it an eating plan because a diet, a lot of people look at diets as short term and once they, quote, lose the weight, then they go back. And there's a statistic that 65% of the people, 60-65% gain their weight back after one year, 95% gain their weight back after five years. And why do we do that? Because you looked at it as just losing the weight and you did not look at it as a lifestyle and you did not get your mindset correct. You've got to work on the mindset. You've got to look at food differently. It's important to look at food as fueling your body. You eat to live instead of living to eat, which is how I was. I could go to a church potluck and pile it up three times when I was younger. Yeah. Yes, me too. <laughs> And now people are so concerned if I don't eat very much at a potluck. I had one lady come up to me and say, what will you eat? I, it, people eating is so important to me. Tell me what to bring. It's like, I'm fine. I'm not starving. What's, what's a good snack for you? Ooh. A carrot? Um, Celery stick? Sometimes. Oh, a, a, a teaspoon of peanut butter. Ooh, that'll fill you up. <laughs> no, just a little. I don't need a lot. Sometimes for a snack. But yeah, my popcorn. Uh-huh, a popcorn. Oh, I love my popcorn. Yeah. So I try not to snack too much. I eat a lot of fruit. I have a smoothie that I drink every day. I eat salads. I, I eat lots of veggies. I eat plenty of food. People have, sometimes don't think I eat very much. I eat a lot. I have been eating, and this is probably wrong, canned fruit. It's a lot of sugar. A lot of sugar in that. Just look at the ingredients. Some do, some don't. So I just look at the picture on the can. If it looks good. <laughs> if it says heavy syrup, you're in trouble. If it's, a, if it's a big pineapple chunk, I buy it. Okay. Well, read your ingredients. That's okay. really, really important to read those ingredients. And on a side note, a lot of people will say, "Well, if it's diet, it must be good for me." Well, actually, oh. the artificial sweeteners can be more dangerous than sugar. So if you're going to eat fruit, just eat the real deal. How about graham it's, crackers? Mm, probably too much sugar. Mm, that's too bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, it's God's pharmacy out there. He created all of this, and, and the foods, that the plants and foods that he created... They're designed to heal your body also. There are certain foods and plants that heal Well, let's get things. into that. Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> can you beat cancer with a fork? Can you beat cancer with a fork? You can. I've you are a it. holistic cancer educator. What does that mean? It means we look at focusing on mindset because, believe it or not, there are certain emotions tied to certain cancers. And so that's one of the first things to look at. 
is what's going on in a person's life. It's not 100%, but the lady that I received my certification from um, helped over 30,000 people, and they watched the emotions of each person and the type of cancer diagnosis they had, and there were certain emotions uh, tied to certain cancers. And then we look at the foods that people eat because... Um, it's just important to pay attention to what is going into the body. All, all it means when a person receives a cancer diagnosis is the terrain is unhealthy. Cancer diagnosis is not always a death sentence. But that doesn't mean we should uh, throw away medicine. No, and surgery, no, no. Surgeries and chemo. No, and, no. Okay. Um, research it. This lady that I worked with... Um, she said, I'm not going to say never, ever do chemo because there's, there's times for it. And yet, if it's a super early diagnosis, look at cleaning up the terrain. Look at cleaning up your thoughts and what's going on in your life and see what happens. And there's a lot of research out there. There are a lot of different websites that you can go to and listen to people's stories that have done that. Is there one particular food you'd recommend to fight cancer um, or prevent cancer? I know. I will let me share for breast cancer because that's a, a, a big. A lot of a lot of uh, people have the women have the breast cancer. Cruciferous, lots of broccoli and cauliflower and kale and those types of foods. The, the breast cancer cells hate that kind of food. Mm. Blueberries. There are just absolutely certain foods that the cancer cells don't like. And so you, you do your research on it and start flooding your body with the right foods and it will make a difference. Mm. It really will. And, you know, instead of waiting to get sick... What if you do it now? Take, you know, give the care to the body now so that you can live that long life, so that you can do for God the way that you want to and be healthy. Is there a point of no return in our health where we just can't? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And like I said, this is temporary. We're a tent in a sense. And so none of us are guaranteed. I mean, one, one of us could step off this stage and fall over and die. It, 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 we're not guaranteed. Yet, I feel like if I will put the right foods into my body and, and give it the right care, I have a better chance. And I've, I feel like I've got a lot to offer right now. I wasted those 40 years, Larry. Mm. And so I'm determined to, to do my best and give my best right now. And that's why I wanted to be here. I want to, I want to share the message of how important it is to, to care for this masterpiece that God created and so that we can be our best spiritually for Him. Get ready for some questions. But one other question Please. here. Tell me about the Wisdom Board and Wisdom Series. What is that all about? Well, I'm really excited about this Wisdom Board and the Wisdom Series. And, and everything's under the umbrella now of Whole Woman of God, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially. And a year ago in June, I was speaking at a Ladies' Day in Southern Arkansas. And they had asked me, the theme was on the Proverbs 31, Woman of Excellence. And as I was studying Proverbs 31, and I read the scripture that said, when she speaks, she speaks with kindness, and her words are wise. And I got to wondering, am I always kind when I speak, and are my words wise? And I had been reading through Proverbs one chapter a day, and you read through it once a month. And I've been doing that for probably four or five years now. And as I was thinking about the wisdom I got to thinking, I wish I had had wisdom scriptures on my walls at home as my children were growing up. And I got to thinking about how I had done a workshop for a vision board. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of a vision board before, and it's where you put 
your goals and dreams and all of that up. And, and so I have one of those. And I thought, why couldn't we have a wisdom board and put wisdom scriptures on it from Proverbs and other, part, other scriptures in the Bible, but specifically Proverbs. And not just the scriptures that are make you feel good when you read it, but scriptures that, that say, seek wisdom, listen to wisdom, guard your heart. The kind of scriptures that you look at it and it's an action to take. Okay, because every time we look at it, it goes into our subconscious mind. And my thought was, you know, if you have a wisdom scripture in every room in your house, every time you walk by it, whether you think you're reading it or not, your subconscious mind, it's going in there. And one of my favorites, uh, I believe it's Proverbs 4, 7 in the New Living Translation says, getting wisdom is the wisest thing I can do. And so it's, I have it written on a, board, on a little chalkboard that sits on the table. And so every time I walk by, I see that, and it reminds me. And I have another one in the kitchen that says, a wise woman builds her home. And I'm, every time I look at that, it reminds me to be wise in the decisions I make, to be wise in the words when I speak to Ken and then to others. And so I thought, why not have this in everyone's home and for your children and your grandchildren to read also every time they walk by when they're there. And so my very first one was on a poster board. I started with just some scriptures printed off, put them on a poster board, and I took it to that ladies' day. And I tell people I'm very creative, but I was not blessed with the artistic ability. My grandmother did oil paintings. She used to paint the baptistries in churches. Mm -hmm. I did not inherit that. So mine are very simple. And then I started getting a little more creative and I had some made and then I bought the little chalkboards and I just use liquid chalk and write on them. And, and it's not so much about it being pretty and fancy. It's about having that scripture there. And so from that, I invited some ladies, some special ladies, and one of them sitting in this audience, to join me on Zoom for a wisdom board workshop. And so they did, and then I told them that um, I was going to be doing a wisdom series. And I created a series, and I told them I was going to be doing that, and I had not even written all the lessons yet. And so week to week, I was writing these lessons and preparing for this wisdom series. And so it was 16 weeks, four months. And first month, four weeks, every Monday night was by wisdom, a spiritual life is built. The next month, by wisdom, an emotional life is built. The next month was by wisdom, a physical life is built. And then the last one, by wisdom, a financial life is built. And so I created that. And so that's also my passion right now. And so I'm going to be doing it for the ladies in Ponca City. And then I'm going to be going to a church in, in Searcy and do the workshop for them. And so that's my, I want to be able to start going and doing the workshops. And if people want, I can, I, we could even do like a, a Friday night, Saturday where we could do workshop. They could create one, two or three boards to take home. And then also I could do part of the series if they wanted me to. Gotcha. Any questions, comments? Do you have a list of foods for prostate cancer? Actually, yes. I've got some. I, I don't have it with me, but I've got it at home. Foods that are best. Yeah. I've got a, my notebook of um, where I went through beatcancer.org to get my certification, and I've got a list of different foods that are, you know, specific to things, and yet still fruits and veggies. Yeah. So yeah, we can talk. Diane, I'm kind of curious, what was your family's reaction when you were being bullied? You know, when you're 14, did your mother just say, ignore it? Or what was the family? There was a time when parents didn't know what to say. Yeah. I didn't know how deep it cut. Um, I had wonderful parents. 
yet I was an embarrassment to my family. And um, just from some things that my brother and sister might have said, and, and, and um, my sister and I are very close now, and, and she apologized. Um, but I don't think they realized how bad it was mm -hmm. because I didn't think they would understand. So, um, yeah, I remember one time, um, and it wasn't everybody. I had some friends, and there were people that, that now look back, and they will say, was I one of the ones that bullied you that I went to high school with? And I was like, no, you were one of the nice ones. Um, but I remember one time in the youth group, we got together one afternoon, and we were going to play touch football. And one of the guys said, let's choose teams. He said, all of us are over here, and Diane is her own team. Mm. So those were the kinds of things, mm. yeah, that people said. And then I've had people, uh, someone tell me one time, you are so pretty. Can you just imagine what you would look like mm. if you lost weight? Mm. So little things like that. When you lose weight and you lose a lot of weight, you have a lot of skin left yes, over. Yes, you do. Have you had surgery, nope. or did you do it with exercise? Um, this is why I wear long sleeves. <laughs> um, no, I did not have any kind of surgery at all, no. And I, 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 the weight came off naturally with the way I ate. It was not a healthy diet as I look at it now. It's still a popular diet, but it's not healthy. Um, and so that's another reason that I'm really focused on, on eating healthy. And no, I've not had any kind of surgery. So, Remember and I the, didn't know to exercise. If I'd have known to exercise back then, I might not have that loose skin. A few years ago, they had the Atkins diet. I believe that was an all meat diet. What do you think of that? That's the one I was on. Oh, really? We called it the grapefruit diet then. And it was, you, eat, you drank, you either drank a small glass of grapefruit juice or ate half of a grapefruit, and then you ate meat and cheese. I ate so much tuna fish <laughs> that I thought I was going to, yeah, be a fish. Wow. I, I, I ate meat, cheese, pickles, green beans, meat, cheese, pickles, green beans. And chocolate pie. Yeah. <laughs> Give it up, Larry. Give it up. <laughs> Anybody else? You said one night they just asked you to come with them to the weight loss mm -hmm. thing. So were they encouraging you? How would you encourage someone else without insulting them? Or did you feel insulted when they asked you no, to come No, I them? didn't feel insulted at all. It, it just felt natural for her because they would, so many of them talking about they needed to lose weight. Um, it's a very, very delicate topic. And this is why I want to approach it the way I approach it, so that people have the right mindset instead of l looking at the body so much because they're overweight and let's lose it so that I look better kind of thing. Let's do it for the right reason and do it, do it for God so that you are, are caring for this amazing creation that he gave us. The book has 10 chapters. Each chapter is a question with four answers. So if you did one answer a day, you would have a 40-day devotional. And then the last third of the book is a 10-week study journal. And so you can go into it and it you know, like week one will take you back to chapter one. And so you could do this on your own or you could get with a group of ladies and study together. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the book is called The Master's Masterpiece. It's available at mastersmasterpiece.com. I tried to find one quote from the book that I could close with, but there are too many good quotes but I did find this. When you think about how God made your delicate inner parts, does this make you want to treat your body, your masterpiece, differently? Life and good health are gifts from God. 
and what we do with that health and how we steward our life is our gift back to God. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us on Stories of Amazing Grace. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next month on Stories of Amazing Grace. Thank you, Diane. Thank you.